Amen. Well, at this time, I'm going to introduce our speaker, uh, Brother Donald Daniels. Uh, Brother Donald with Gideons International here in Clayton. Uh, I'm going to let him come and share uh, about the Gideons and the work they do. I think most of you are familiar with it, uh, but um, yet there may be somebody here today uh, that needs to know. Uh, God bless you, brother. Thank you. No, you can't go. Alejandro tells when he was nine years old of receiving some furniture from a Jewish neighbor. And his family, um, what he'd received out of all that was a little nightstand to go beside his bed. And Alejandro says, in that nightstand, he found a little brown book like this right here. He started reading, started getting a little bit intrigued and uh, wanted to know a little bit more about it. And he said he later heard some children singing some Christian songs. So he asked some questions about those songs. And they told him, yes. and Dad said, no, you can't go. You know, nine-year-old boys don't always do everything they're told, right? So he went anyway. Well, Mom and Dad started noticing something a little different about their son. So they sent the older brother to follow Alejandro on Sunday mornings and on Wednesdays and whenever they had the services. And they figured out. It wasn't long the older son was doing something a little different and acting a little different because he'd been saved also. Well, mom and dad eventually started attending that church. Mom was saved and dad, the alcoholic, eventually gave his life to Christ. We hear that story because Alejandro went on to be a missionary in the jungles of Ecuador. And it's because of folks like you supporting Guineas International. But somehow, a Jewish man put a little testament he didn't need into a piece of furniture and gave it away. As a missionary arm of Everett's Chapel, there are more than 260,000 Gideon Auxiliary, the wives of Gideons, uh, placing God's co copies, about two and a half copies of God's Word every time your heart beats. We're doing this in about 200 countries right now and having it translated in 109 different languages. And we're still going into places like fire departments, hospitals, hotels, uh, many of the traffic lanes of life, doctor's offices, and wherever we can. And we're going to ask you to pray that we continue to get into more places to be able to place God's word. Because we know that God's word is important. Isaiah 55, 11 reminds us, So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper into the thing whereto I send it. Like in a hotel, Elaine tells of a day that she was on the way back home. She just lost a child in a court custody case. Being tired and distraught, she stopped off at a hotel, checked in, and found a copy of God's Word, a Bible being placed by the Gideons next, on the nightstand next to the bed. She started reading, and Elaine says she found the peace and the comfort she needed that evening. Um, and she, when she left, she said, I, I took that Bible with me. And she said, because I got on my knees, and Christ came into my heart. Well, sometime later, Elaine had a nephew living with her, and he was using that same Bible and doing a little Bible study with a neighbor, and uh, after the nephew left, she said, I noticed that Bible was missing. So she later questioned the nephew about it. And she said, Nep uh, he admitted to taking it. He said, she said, son, that's okay. Because that Bible was hot. I had taken it from a hotel years ago. <laughs> you know, as Gideons, we don't encourage theft. But we do know that God's word provides peace. So whenever anybody needs one, take it. Because there's churches that support us just like you do so that Bible could be replaced anyway. All right. Thank you for, for supporting us and allowing us to be able to support, uh, replace that Bible for people like Elaine who need it. See, we estimate those Bibles in a hotel might have a six-year life, touch 2,300 people, but we try to be good stewards with those Bibles. See, when the Bible has that useful purpose and we go in and we check them and the covers don't look good anymore, we can cut the covers off and put these paper covers on them. And we use these paper covered Bibles now to be able to use in the jails and the prisons and homeless shelters, places like that. So we continue to try to be in the recycling business, try to recycle God's word and put it where it needs to be, wherever he tells us. Because see, God tells each of us in Acts 1.8, ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the othermost parts of the world. We have Gideon men and women who live and work and share God's word in countries all around the world. But folks, God is telling you, each one of you right here today, at Walmart, at 
Cleveland over here, Smithfield, Raleigh, wherever you are, to be a witness for Christ. Always, wherever we are, be a witness for Christ. And we know that um, statistics have told us that the average American home has about nine Bibles in it. With the Gideons around the world, folks, there's Gideons who are traveling hours through the jungles, over mountains, to be able to put a copy, the only book some children ever, ever see, the copy of God's Word in their hands. And it's because of you folks who were able to do that. But see, right here, those same statistics tell us in America that only 15% of churchgoers read the 31,102 verses that are there on a daily basis. So I encourage you to get your Bible out and read it because you're blessed to have something that many people do not. But we do know that there's a hungry world out there. Y'all know about the lost folks. Be praying for us as over the next few weeks, tens of thousands of these little testaments are going to be out and available in the hands of college students as throughout the state. They'll be getting us placing as these college students, just like the pastor's daughter, will be out be able to place those um, testaments in their hands. And at the fairs and the carnivals and the festivals, and folks, I can tell you right now, I've personally witnessed people at the North Carolina State Fair. Many of you have probably gone up there for the rides or everybody tells me the food, right? But I can tell you I've seen people starving at the North Carolina State Fair. No, they might have been walking by with a funnel cake in their hand because I looked into their eyes, and I can tell you right now they were lost. They were looking for something that that funnel cake or those foot-long hot dogs or whatever's deep fried can't fulfill. It's only the Word of God. And because of you folks and your prayers and encouragement, do we have men and women for all 10 days at the fair that are placing and looking to place Bibles in the hands of those folks that are lost. We thank you for that. Thank you for supporting us. Today I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Pray that hearts will be open for those folks who receive those testaments. People who come and stick their hand out and willing to take one. But also be praying that we have more doors open to us. There's some schools and some jails and places we can't get to any longer. We ask for your help. And then if there's anyone here who says, yeah, I want to be a part of what you guys are doing. I like seeing somebody come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Then see me or the pastor after the service because I'll be glad to tell you how to become a part of a ministry that's over 100 years old with business uh, men and, and our, and our wives going out and sharing God's word. But you say, well, you know, I really don't have time to do that. See, there's another way you can help us too, become friends of the Gideons. Now you can be, become a prayer or a financial partner with us and you can still receive some of the testaments, the testimonies and the things that we get to share. Okay? Be glad to listen to any of them. Uh, help you find that part. But you know, some of you might say, yeah, well, I can at least help support you a little bit. Folks, all those testimonies I share because somebody got a Bible, right? Somebody found something that a, folks in a church like you help provide. And at the end of the service, I'll be out front. We'll be glad to do whatever we can to pray for you and then use whatever you choose to support the Gideons with to make sure, because all the money goes to putting God Bibles in people's hands, God's Word. Thank you for your time today. One more thing I wanted to mention, I'm sorry. Pastor mentioned this earlier about the cards. This happens to be in your memory card, but there's also cards out there that you can send to someone encouraging. You can send to some of these college students who just left and gone away. Because folks, when folks, when any of you receive a card, sometimes you're encouraged, right? You, everybody likes opening a card. Somebody's wrote a note to you. Well, ladies, I'm going to encourage you to go and take those cards home with you. Because when you get ready to use a card, you're going to think, oh, man, they're in that racket at the church. Right? Go and take them home because they're free to you. But most importantly, you get to get encouraged when you send somebody one. Whoever receives it gets to be encouraged. And then inside, there's a little envelope. You might drop a check in. Folks, for the less... Less than the cost of a glass of iced tea. You can change a whole family's life like Alejandro's. You can drop in a little check, send it to it. It's already stamped. You can send it back to the Giddens, and it helps pay for those Bibles that we're placing all around the world. Thank you, folks, for your time today. Thank you for your prayers. Just continue to lift us up. Because God wants us to do the work that you'd have us to do. Thank you.
Amen. Um, as Brother Donald said, uh, for any of you men um, that would like to, uh, or families that would like to participate, um, I began um, in ministry, uh, not only working with the youth in the church um, where God would eventually call me to preach, but uh, I also was working with the youth and the Gideons uh, in the Wayne County camp. Um, and um, I enjoyed going uh, and changing out and ex exchanging uh, testaments in the in the hotels. I enjoyed standing and giving out uh, testaments. Um, but um, it's a it's it's a great ministry. Uh, it really is, and I do thank y'all for uh, being with us today and sharing. Uh, don't forget, the rack's always in the foyer. Uh, the cards are always there, and they're there not only to help support the Gideons, but they're there to be an encouragement to families. Uh, we use it a lot with families that have lost loved ones. Uh, we send out uh, five or ten Bibles in memory of, um, and uh, the family gets the card. Um, and someone who's looking Christ uh, gets the uh, gets the testament. Uh, so anyway, uh, and y'all know how I am about you reading your Bible, right? Yeah. All right, they're not for decoration. They're tools. You're supposed to be using them. Uh, I've told you before, if you wear the one out you got and you can't afford another one, then you come see me. Um, I have no problem giving out Bibles. Um, so... Uh, uh, but um, we do uh, we do we do want to continue this ministry and supporting it. Uh, there is a offering plate in the foyer on your way out. If you'd like to give to the Gideon's International today, uh, make the check out to Gideon's International. Uh, if you're going to give a check or cash, you can just drop it in the uh, foyer out there. All the money goes uh, to uh, the the camp here in uh, Clayton, and they will. Uh, take care of it from there. Uh, but anyway, Brother Donald, Brother George, good to have you all with us today and your uh, lovely wife. Always good to see her. Um, been, a, been a year, but anyway, uh, it's good to have him with us today. All right. Um, we're going to continue in the Word of God. How about that? Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 22. I'm going to begin today with asking you a question, and uh, you know I'm the, I like questions, right? Uh, the questions make you think, right? Well, some of you, okay. All right, I'll stomp my feet in a few minutes, and that'll get you going. All right, but anyway, okay. What is in a name? What is in a name? I mean, there was a time and a place, there was a time in this country where you didn't sign contracts, you shook hands. Why? Because your name meant something. Your reputation meant something. It meant something in your life and it meant something to your family. It meant something to your community. And the thing is, is that we've got so far away from that now that everything has to be signed and notarized in order for us to even be able to deal with one another. But that's not the way God works. That's not God's desire. That's not God's will or His way. Because you see, the thing about it is, is that when we bowed our knees before Him and we asked Him to forgive us of our sins, and He did so because He is True, he's just and he's faithful to do just that, what we ask. When he forgave us of our sins, he gave us a new name. He cleaned up the old us and he gave us something new. And so from that day forward, you should have been a representative of your new self, not your old. I'll say that one more time. You should have been a representative of your new self and not your old. 
The scripture says we become new creatures in Christ. That we are new. We are made over. We can't make ourselves over. We can't change ourselves. But God can. He's able. He's able to clean us up. He's able to deliver us and bring us out of whatever darkness we're in. I was listening to the radio on the way over here, and the, the guy on the radio was talking about a missionary that, that when he left to go uh, to the South Pacific, he loaded everything that he had in a coffin, and he took it with him. Well, I thought that was kind of strange, too. But considering that he was going to an island in the South Pacific, uh, the chances were not real good that he would have had anything when he died. He was not planning on coming back. God had called him to a purpose. His name had been changed. He was now saying, I am a Christian. I'm a missionary for the front lines of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not planning on coming back. And when I die, they've got something to bury me in. But his statement on his, the, what's, on his tombstone kind of caught my eye or my ear when I heard it. It said, when I came here, there was no light. When I died, there was no darkness. Hmm? So you think about that. What is in a name? Here in the Word of God, in Proverbs 22, verses 1 and 2, Solomon deals with that very question. So if you're able this morning, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Proverbs 22, verses 1 and 2. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. May God bless the reading and expounding of His holy word. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our name, sh our name should mean far more as the sons and daughters of God. You hear that? Because we are blood-bought, born again, because Jesus died for us, because God has grafted us into his family. Ooh, I don't know about none of you, but I'm excited about being grafted into the family of God, okay? Oh, that's a great big family. I like that. I like the fact that, that, that I don't have to worry about a place to live because he's already got that taken care of. He meets my needs here on this earth. He meets your needs here on this earth. But he says that when you leave this world, I've already prepared you a place. I've prepared you a home. Jesus said, if it won't so, I would have told you it won't so. He said, but I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, oh, and Christians can't find nothing to be excited about. There you shall be also. You think about what he says. Solomon says here, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And I want you to notice that he wasn't talking about just to having a hundred dollar bill. He's talking about being abundantly rich. He says a good name, to have a good name is better than having all the riches of the world. But you see, the thing is, is that nobody has a desire for their name anymore. You see, I noticed, I noticed that when I was in the secular world as a uh, project superintendent for a large construction company. I noticed over every year it seemed harder and harder to find contractors that cared about the work they did. But you see, church, when God works in us and delivers us and brings us out of our pit and our miry clay and He sets our feet on the rock of ages, He's expecting of us 
He's expecting a change in us. He's expecting us to go from not caring much or little to caring a lot. Because I'm no longer my representative. I no longer carry my name. You no longer carry your name. You carry the name of Christ. When you profess to be a Christian and a follower of the Lord Jesus, you carry His name. You now become a representative of His. Her name should mean far more as the sons and daughters of God. Who we identify as matters. You see, in the in the in the Word of God, the, especially in the in the Old Testament, the name of God meant something. Well, you say, preacher, I know that. He's God. No, every name that God had in the Old Testament. Of all the names that he had, each one of them meant something specific. The first name would be El, and it means the strong one. His name meant he is the strong one. He's the creator of all things. He's the one that can shape the world and place the universes. But yet at the same time, he's tender and gentle enough to pick up the sparrow when he falls. He's compassionate and loving enough to pick us up when we fall. Eloah, the mighty one. Not only is he strong, but he is the mighty one. Elohim, the almighty. Jehovah, he is the self-existence one. Woo! You see, his name means something. And when you say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to understand who it is you're saying you are. Because you've had an identity change. You're supposed to have had an identity change. What does the scripture say about Jesus, though? Huh? Well, the same thing, church. His list of names goes on to well over a hundred in the scriptures. He is the advocate, the almighty. He's alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the anointed one, the prince. He's anointed above his fellows. He is the arm of the Lord. And it goes on and on. He's the good shepherd. He's the savior and redeemer of the world. You see, the thing is, is that in the scriptures, names mean something. And as believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our name means something. We should be ecstatic about what God has done in our lives and that He's doing in our lives. A good name is rather to be chosen. He says it's got to be something you want, you desire. Who we identify as matters, church. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, we're told to put on the new man. Which, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created us. In other words, God himself says you're not who you used to be. You see, the thing about it is, is that the scriptures tell us, and we've studied it, and you know it from the word of God, that when we get to heaven, we get a new name. There's nothing of this world going into his kingdom. Not only do we get new garments, not only are we glorified by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into His image and His likeness, we get a new name. We get to sing a new song. He says He makes all things new, right? I mean, all things new. So who are we? Who and what is a name? 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, the thing is, is it's about an identity change. You see, what Brother Donald was saying was that these Bibles that they put out changes people's identities. It changes who they are. It changes where they're at. It changes their life. And church, let me tell you, we should have a heart to see lives changed. We should want to see people changed. If he can do it for me and you, oh, he can do it for the vilest of offenders. Well, you might say, well, that was me. Well, was is the key. Because you see, God is able to set right that which is wrong. That was a discussion that me and uh, that Nancy and myself had on the way home yesterday because we were listening to some of the things that were going on and, and conversations that were going on on, uh, on that place that I hate above all things in this world, social media. Uh, it ought to be named, Show Your Ignorance. I mean, uh, let's be honest. But the thing about it is we were discussing and I said, well, the only good, the only silver lining in all of this that's going on in the world today is, is that one day God's going to set it all right. That's the silver lining in all of it, church, is that we have to stay fast, be steadfast in our faith, continue to do what God has called us to do until Jesus comes again and God is going to set it right. He's going to make that which is wrong right. And we can say, well, that's a whole lot of things in the world around us today. But let me go ahead and assure you that God is still on the throne and He is still sovereign. He's still in control of all things, even though it looks a little chaotic. You just need to remember that in the end, it's all right. It's all good. You see, I like the thought. I just hold on to that thought that this world began in paradise and it's going to end in paradise. Huh? Adam was created, formed by the hands of God in the beginning. And in the end, he says, I'm going to take all things that are old and I'm going to make them new. Ooh. There you amen, brother. I'm going to make them over. I'm going to redo it all. I'm going to make it right. But you see, the thing is, is that we have to remember that it takes, it takes a faith. It takes us repenting. And I, 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 you know me, I throw that word out there because I believe repentance is important. Um, you can have all the faith you want to have, but if you have not repented of your sins, faith does you no good. And they, the world doesn't want to hear that anymore because what, what repentance does is it says, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And then Jesus says to us, or to them, or whoever it may be. The same thing he said to the woman caught in adultery, get up, go, and sin no more. Because you see, that requires a change. That's the reason they don't want to do that part of it. I want heaven, and I want faith, and I want Jesus, but I don't want to do that part of it because it requires that I have to change who I hang out with, who my friends are, how I live. I can't go to places that I want to go, that the flesh wants to go, that don't really do me any good anyway. just gets me in trouble. But yet, who am I? You see, as, as a follower of Christ, then we need to remember that we are supposed to be a new man. We're supposed to be a new person. We're supposed to have been created over again. But you see, there is only two lives we can live in this world two we either live as the sons of God and the daughters of God 
Or we live like Jesus said, our father, the devil. You see, the thing is, these are the two lives scripturally that we're called, that we, that we know that the world is living now. You're either living for the cause of Christ with a new identity. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a, a, am, I love him. That's what the child of God does is he loves the father. I come across a, a story, Catherine Booth, who helped her husband form an organization called the Salvation Army, uh, told the story of a man who, who shed, he breathed and shed abroad the very spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he talked about Jesus and Jesus only. If he opened his mouth to speak, he spoke of Christ. He spoke of nothing else. It was always Christ. And when he was about to die, some of his friends and, and some of his family, they, they realized that there was a, a, a document that remained that he needed to sign. And, and although he was very weak at the time, they put a pen in his hand and he grasped it and he began to write as he guided the, to the, he was guided to the place where he signed the name. Feebly he wrote and then fell into a coma and died. When his friends looked at the signature, they discovered that he had written Jesus where he should have put his name. Jesus. What a name. But you see, the thing is, is that he had spoke of Christ so much in his, li in his life that that became his identity. That's who he was. He was a servant of God. He didn't write it there out of blasphemy. He wrote it there because of the life that he had lived. Because he had loved Jesus so much in his lifetime. That's who he identified with. And I can assure you, church, that if that's our identity, then we have nothing in the world to fear. You see, we are considered by Scripture to be the sons of God if we've done these things. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Who are you following today? Are you following the news feeds? And well, they own the, they own the way that's wide and leads to destruction. Who are you following today? Because he says, if we are led by the Spirit of God, then we are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The church, we are changed. We're new. When we have a new identity, when they say, who are you? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a son of the living God. Not by my birthright, but by the birthright of Jesus Christ. Not by my doings, but what Jesus has done. Let me tell you what he's done for you. Let me explain to you the love of God. Because you see, you're looking for love in all the wrong places, right? You're looking for it in everywhere you go, but yet the ultimate love is right there beside you. The ultimate of love is right there with you, just waiting for you to call out. You see, we don't have, we've received that spirit of adoption. We're new, we're created new. We're made new in Christ. We now become the children of God. We have a place. This is not my home. The apostle Paul says, hey, look, I'm looking forward to the next place. 
I'm glad for everything. I'm happy about everything and thankful for everything that God has done in my life. But this is not my home. Thank God. Won't it be nice when you can stand around the throne of God and and sing a song and not hear no quarreling or bickering or grumbling or murmuring, no dissent or discourse. Everybody have a smile on their face and their hands raised high and they'll be praising and worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Won't it be nice? Well, that's our future as the children of God. Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7. And because you are the sons of God, because you are the sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. You've got an identity change. Solomon said, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, the loving favor of God rather than silver and gold. I had rather identify with God and get his favor and his rewards than anything the world could ever give me. Is that you? I mean, because that's what he's saying to us. And he says the thing you need to remember is that the rich and the poor, they were all created by God. They are all his creation. The rich are made rich for a purpose. But I don't think many of them are doing their purpose. It becomes about the next million and the next million. It becomes about the money and not the purpose. You see, the thing about it is, is that we are all created by God. We are all loved by God. For God so loved the world, right church? But you need to remember this. that the scriptures tell us, and Jesus tells us of it, in John chapter 8 verse 42 we need to remember that there is another identity in the world. Not just the sons of God, but there is an identity that is worldly and, uh, well, as we can see in the world today, satanic, demonic. All demonic activity in this world is on a level unlike any that has ever been seen before. Why? Why? Because so many more people, even leadership now, are embracing the demonic side of the world. Church, but the church can't. And Jesus warns, he says, if if God were your father, you would love me. That's what Jesus said. He said, if my father, if God was your father, you would love him. Above all things, you would love him. For I proceed forth and come from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. And then Jesus goes on to say, Why do you not understand my speech? Why do you not understand what I'm saying? If God is your father, you would love me. Even because you cannot hear my words. Because the devil is a master at the lie. He's a master at deceit. And you need to remember who he is. You are the father, your devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer. From the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. There's two lives in this world that are lived. They are either lived as the true sons of God or they are lived as the children of Satan. 
But you see, it doesn't have to be that way. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, In all thy ways acknowledge Him. Huh? Oh, come on now. In all, in all, all means what, church? It means all, all the time, right? In all thy ways. Now do you see what Solomon is saying? Solomon says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall, what? Direct thy paths. You see, the thing is, is that Solomon was just pointing us to a new identity. He was trying to encourage us into who we are. Whether we're rich or poor, we belong to God. But we're children of God, right? Blood bought, born again. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's our identity. That's who we are. Stop identifying with the world. For you see... What is in a name? On an island in Malaysia in a mission. I'm going to share one more with you. Here's the story of a young boy who's, whom Bishop John uh, Selwyn tried to train on Norfolk Island. The boy had been raised among one of the most savage cannibal tribes in the South Sea. One day the bishop rebuked the boy for misbehavior and the boy responded by punching him in the face. The bishop quietly turned and walked away. Eventually the boy uh, who was considered to be beyond hope was sent back to his own island where he soon returned to the barbarous ways of his people. Years later, a missionary on, on, the, on that island visited a severely ill man. The same person who years before had assaulted his would-be benefactor. The sick man was dying and he asked to be baptized. When preparing to comply with the request, the missionary asked, but what name would you like to be known as a Christian? Call me John Selwyn, replied the native. That is the, that is the man who, when I struck him, taught me what Christ was like. The dying man chose a good name. He did as the scriptures tell us to do. He turned the other cheek. He showed love above. He showed love above the recourse and action of reaction. And church, let me tell you something. Let your name be something. Even in the world today, a handshake should still mean something. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. Because it's not your name that you're standing behind. It's the name of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who you represent. That you're standing behind. And you will never know. You may not ever know. The impact. Of standing behind his name means. See that man could have chose any name he wanted to choose. But he chose the name that had showed him grace and mercy. You see the thing is. Is what will we be remembered for. In our lifetime. Will we be remembered for grace and mercy? Showing someone grace and mercy, whether they deserve it or not, you need to remember that that's exactly what God has done with us. Even when we didn't deserve His love, He still loved us. Yet while we were still sinners, He sent Christ to die for us. I'm telling you, church, 
This is the life-changing experience of love and faith. This is grace and mercy. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Love and favor rather than silver and gold. The world has nothing to offer you more than what Jesus has already offered you. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this place. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your holy word. Lord, I thank you for those that have heard and those that are here. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for each and every heart. May we change our identity. May we know who we are when we go out into the world. We are children of God. I'm a child of the King. Lord, lead us, guide us, and direct us. We give you all praise, honor, and glory for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.